And so I'm going to also ask for any audience comments, uh, probably a little sooner than I sometimes would. But I want to, first of all, thank you for taking the time. Thank you for making this fabulous film. Um, and for the work that you're obviously doing. Um, we are also, as you know, making a, an award to you of one of our fellow Vermonters, uh, Thaddeus Stevens, who um, actually lived in a ha home uh, two houses away from the house I live in, in Peacham, Vermont, uh, and taught actually at the same school where I taught back in the 1970s. So we feel uh, an affinity and appreciation for Thaddeus Stevens and for the role that he played as a Vermonter um, in the fight against us, slavery in particular. Uh, and so we, we dedicated this award to him. We're also giving a second award this year for the first time to a picture called Bad Axe, which we showed last night, uh, about a young man whose family um, in Bad Axe, Michigan, um, ran a, run a small restaurant and uh, experienced a number of uh, racially charged challenges during the pandemic and uh, it's a very interesting film and if you get a chance I would recommend that you see it. It's a nice film. Uh, his mother is uh, Mexican and his father's Cambodian who came uh, to America from the killing fields. Um, but at the same time, as Vermonters, I'm aware of two things, one of which is that Ben and Jerry's helped to finance your film, which I'm very pleased to hear. Yeah. And the other thing is that two weeks ago in Rutland, Vermont, which is just 40 minutes away from here, uh, a local gun show was selling uh, shackles that were clearly identified uh, for the purpose of, an, of uh, restraining uh, black women and children. And it became an issue. The local NAACP raised it as an issue. But I found it shocking that in 2022, in, this, in the great liberal state of Vermont, although there are always challenges, uh, that this would happen. Um, but this notion of sort of fetishizing memorabilia from the period of enslavement uh, for, to, to be acquired as cultural you know, icons uh, at a gun show was pretty upsetting here. Um, we obviously have a lot of work to do. I guess I would just like to begin by, you know, I'm, I'm sure this film has had a lot of impact. If you could share with us some of the impact it has had. And also when people in small towns are looking for ways to be involved, relevant, and appropriate to this particular moment, uh, what thoughts you might share. Uh, the first thing I wanted to say is that we are incredibly honored uh, to receive the award and to share it with the film uh, that you talked about. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much for that. And, you know, in terms of impact, uh, our goal was to get as many people in America to see this, as many people as possible people outside of America as well, but essentially in the United States. And uh, Sony Pictures Classics has been a great partner in doing that. The film is on Netflix now, and so we're getting all kinds of feedback, and this is exactly what we wanted. We wanted people to have to reckon with our true history. And I would just say that it was, it is of course very upsetting to hear you talking about uh, people fetishizing uh, the implements of enslaving people in this country. But you can look at that and say, oh my God, how could this happen in Vermont in 2022? And the only way, really, that you get to ask that question is if you're ignorant of our history. Because if you know the history that's in this film, this may be upsetting, it may be horrific, but it is certainly not surprising because this has been going on for the past 200 years in this country. And I think that's one of the things, one of the impacts we want to have is to open people's eyes to say what you thought was done and is just kind of on the fringe, that never happened. And if we understand the truth, we've got a chance to do something about it. One of the things that's been really, really upset us is, is 
hearing from back from viewers, viewers now, we've been able to do um, a lot more and a lot more films on Netflix and how, how they've, been, they've been able to with their with children, with their loved ones, with their, their teachers, you know, been able to start start dogs and families where, where they haven't been able, been able to touch issues of race before. Or, um, and we really believe uh, that, that the only way to move forward as a, as a country, the only chance we have at improve, improving um, uh, the situation of all Americans is to look back and understand our past and really, really you know, embrace it, learn from it, and, um, uh, be held accountable for, for it. Um, and then and, and hope to a better place. If we have questions in the audience, just raise your hand and I will work it into our conversation, certainly by repeating the question. Um, yes, we have a question right here. I don't have a question, I just have a comment. Um, your quote from Orwell at the beginning, he who controls the present controls the past, Quote from Orwell, he who controls the present controls the past. Ron DeSantis, a product of two of the most elite institutions in this country, yeah. clearly yeah. visualizes himself as at least a candidate for president. And look at what he's doing to Florida, and he's not the only one. So but raising the question of Ron DeSantis, a uh, product of uh, the elite educational institutions who is thinking of running for president. Uh, the suggestion being, I, I think, that he knows better and how, and how, and how um, in his acting in this manner, and it, which would include um, restricting, frankly, probably the showing of this film, since this film would be considered part of what he calls critical race theory that he wishes not to be shared with students. Um, that's interesting because if you, I'll just say very quickly, watch the film again. There's no theory in this film. This is about what people did and what they said about what they did. And I think you call that history. It's not any kind of theory. It's what happened and what people did. And it's not that Ron DeSantis knows better. Ron DeSantis knows exactly what he's doing. This is intentional and purposeful because he understands that if this truth is widely spread around America, our true history, especially among the minds of high school students and middle school students, then there's going to be a change in this country. And that's what he's afraid of. If people are wondering how impactful is this information, just ask yourself, Look at all the efforts that are going on around this country to try and stop this information from getting out there. That tells you how dangerous this information is. Other comments, questions? Uh, woman in the back. Uh, two weeks ago from today, I, I was able to walk across the Pettus Bridge. Uh, because I was in Montgomery visiting the Legacy Museum. Woman who walked across the Pettus Bridge two weeks ago uh, visiting the uh, Legacy Museum. An amazing, amazing place. Yeah. And coincidentally, I wrote my college thesis in 1968 on Thaddeus Stevens. Wrote her college thesis in 1968 about Thaddeus Stevens. To annoy my southern Good. relatives. Uh, yes, we have another question right here. Yes. This is a comment of appreciation to all of you for having put together this uh, really amazing movie. Um, after George Floyd's death, I decided I needed to read more and more about uh, black and people of color's history. And that's all I focused on for the last two and a half years. And the beauty of this film for me today is that you brought it all into a visual, what I've been reading about. The beauty of the film really synthesizing what this uh, gentleman has been uh, focused on reading for the last two and a half years uh, into a concise and powerful uh, statement. Uh, I'm going to take another comment and I'm going to offer a question of my own. Yes. No, just this Anybody has questions? This is an actual question. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I'm just, uh, I'm curious. Uh, this film was obviously made before January 6th, and I'm, I'm curious what um, you think uh, 
which direction you think the ball is going to move. The film uh, was made before January 6th. Thoughts about which direction the ball is going to move. I mean, of course, there's been a lot that's happened even yes, since January 6th that yeah. further uh, yeah. covers the act, that yeah, question. Um, Emily, you want to talk about that? <laughs> um, well, you know, I mean, you know, you just just said that uh, that this um, where the ball the balling, it's not it's not minutes, it's days, you know, and we're at moments of transition. So you know, you know, events that happened re recently wouldn't necessarily necessarily change trajectory. I mean, Jeff and I are both both optimists. Um, we're, hope, we're hoping that that all of this uh, um, opposition and and, and uh, you know uh, loud voices that are happening on the fringe uh, signify change. You know, we're we're hoping hoping that also upset means means that the power um, the, uh, are are begin, beginning to feel that um, the ground the ground beneath is shifting and that um, a, a future is on the rise. So um, so I think we both are very hopeful about. It about the, the place that this country is going. You know, the, the upsets we've, that's we've been in. I was active during the Vietnam War movement, and there was a, a comment that, that I received from Vietnamese during that time, that the water bubble always kicks the hardest before it's about to die. Uh, <laughs> but, um, and it's interesting, your, your story about um, the idea of white friends buying your family's home, uh, Jeff, because um, the same thing happened to Harry Belafonte in Manhattan. I don't know if you know that story. But he wanted to buy an apartment in Manhattan and uh, found a place uh, on West End Avenue and tried to buy it and was turned down. After he'd been trying to rent places before that and was turned down, and so he got his publicist to buy the building at 300 West End Avenue and then occupied the building and shared it with a number of other friends who were having difficulty, including Lena Horn in, in uh, New York City. The idea that this happened in Manhattan in the early 60s is, you know, further evidence of what you're describing. Right. Um, in Vermont, you know, we've had, there's actually a, currently a series of podcasts that are running on public radio here that address the fact of how many African Americans in the state of Vermont have come here and, and found basically, you know, inhospitable and racist responses in, in these communities, this very white liberal state, predominantly white liberal state, and have left the state, uh, despite the fact that, you know, Bernie Sanders is our senator, and we have a long history of, or at least a long recent history of, of you know, liberal representation in Congress and the rest. And in trying to think about what it is that people can actually do, and I think this is true partly because, and it's sort of an idea that I've been talking with friends and working on in some ways, is the one thing we can do is build our own local communities in the in the shape that we believe is important and that to affect national politics is hard. We can weigh in where we, where we can. But that actual communities uh, that are diverse and come together intentionally and meaningfully as multiracial, you know, gender diverse communities uh, and where people actively begin to foster you know, dance parties or barbecue recipe competitions or, you know, discussion groups or film screenings, you know, because I think that there's actually not enough, and especially in the virtual world, there's not enough actual person-to-person -person connection that is breaking down these barriers. Uh, and that in, in the internet age, where people are gleaning all this information online, the real problem is they're not connecting directly with other people and they're not connecting in diverse community. One could argue that redlining just by itself was partly an effort to prevent that from happening. Of course it was, because we weren't considered human enough to eat in the same restaurant or use the same bathroom or go to the same school. And the fact that those voices hadn't been loud in Vermont doesn't mean they weren't there. And I think part of what's happening is that over the past 10 years, it is, you know, there are politicians who have made people feel very comfortable in expressing those ideas. 
And so, I, I, I believe me, I completely understand that. That's my perception of Vermont too. But that's one of the things this history will do is start to shape your perceptions. And so, you know, you talk about people connecting with each other, and that's absolutely true. And if there are black families or other families of color that are experiencing racism in Vermont, one thing our community can do is to overwhelm that family or that business with support. If there is a restaurant that is, has been receiving racist harassment, then people can start going to it five nights a week or seven nights a week if they're open. Make them the most uh, uh, profitable and wonderful restaurant in the city. That will show people. You know, you're, you're trying to say, how can we come together and do something that will have an impact? Use your dollars to have an impact. Ask yourself where you're spending your money. And if there are businesses that are operated or owned by people of color, or businesses that are making uh, affirmative efforts to go out and employ people of color and bring them into the organization, then support those businesses. And the last thing I'll say, I'll, I'll toss it to Emily, is I just think it's important to arm yourself for these conversations. And when I say arm yourself, I don't mean with weapons, I mean with facts. So you have someone spewing, uh, the president can declassify any document he wants to. Someone can say that, but if you're having a conversation and you say to someone, there are actually statutes and regulations on how declassification occurs, and it's a very specific thing, and here I can show them to you, and this shows you that the president can't just say, they're declassified, and it happens. You can challenge people with knowledge, but you have to go out and get that knowledge. So come to our website, thewhoweareproject.org. There are all kinds of resources there, and that's one of the ways that you can start. Inform yourself about our past and how it's impacting my future. Does anybody have a question here? Okay, one, one, of, one of the concerns I also sense is that um, you know, the civil rights movement had made huge gains and, and substantial achievements, and yet, yes, of course, there was much more to do. Um, but as a result of the civil rights movement, we are not in the same position today as we were 50 years ago in terms of, in particular, black people having a stronger voice, more presence, better opportunities in education. It, a long, long way is still necessary to go. But it seems to me that what is required as we, as we look at voting rights being rolled back, for one, um, is the need to mount a, a civil rights movement that begins to cohere around these fundamental rights and also the history that was associated with securing them in the first place and the dangers of rolling them back now. Do we have the conditions um, I mean, what, what the civil rights movement developed over a period of decades gained consistently momentum, power, coherence, and, you know, effectiveness. Now there are plenty of sort of sentiments being expressed, but the efforts to, to roll back the gains of the civil rights movement are decentralized and they appear not to be at the center of a national uh, dialogue or agenda in the way they became in the 1960s. Emily, what do you think? Uh, I mean, I think uh, lead it look different these days. You know, it isn't just one per person or one as it was at that then or men standing up um, and being listened to. You know, it's 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 spread out throughout the country. And I, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad ad thing, um, to have that kind of diversity of voices. It, it may be from the outside, it doesn't, it doesn't seem um, cohesive. It's definitely, it, it's, it's definitely more um, inviting to many more, more different people um, that, than it hasn't in the past, and that there's room for, for other things that maybe there hadn't been in the past. So I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, we definitely agree that uh, dis discuss discussion and work in action around voting right rights crucial at, at this, this moment. Now, I mean, it's it's it, you know issues of of, uh, um, of racism and, and 
you know, no, have been used by the people in power to, to divide us, to uh, pass, pacify us, to uh, make make us a hopeful, hope, hopeless list, you know, um, just like Ron DeSantis is doing, fanning these flames, you know, you know, of meaningless fringe, fringe you know, but, but they they're actually do damage, you know, they make you feel like, um, there's no hope that their that their vote matter that, that it's not important not important that out because you know there, there's there's it's an impossible possible battle um, and and then we, we do see um, we do see we see a lot of it needs to be done and actually the who we are project our project working right now uh, um, I, I, I I get votes a do documentary animated short that we're gonna gonna be working right before the election that's hopefully gonna be gonna that uses history to, to teach about the the important importance. Um, of the right to vote and of vote conscience um, um, when you're on to do that. Okay. And if I, if I could just add something, I think the history is so important because if you remember one of the quotes in the film from Dr. King when he talked about getting victories at bargain rates, so to speak, my parents were active in the civil rights movement. We lived in Memphis, Tennessee. This isn't something I read about in a book. I was living it every day of my life when I grew up in Memphis. And I am so proud of what was done during that period and the changes that my parents saw when we were able to walk into a restaurant and sit down next to white people and get served. But I think it's important to understand when you characterize the gains of the civil rights movement as huge gains, they weren't. For, for 90 years after the Civil War, separate but equal was the law of America. Not just the custom of America, the law of America. And so from 1954 to 1968, what happened in the Civil Rights Movement, especially looking back on it, because we have, that's the power of history. If you don't understand the history, you misconceive what happened. And looking back on it, what, what we got from the Civil Rights Movement was basically the right to stop having the N-word thrown in our face under color of law. We got the right to vote unless you were convicted and a felon, and the criminal justice system was, was weeding as many of us into that system as is possible. We got the Voting Rights Act and the, and the Fair Housing Act, and America is still today as segregated as it was back in the 1960s. So it's not that those gains weren't important, because they were. But people felt like, oh, we've accomplished everything. And that goes into the narrative of Jared Kushner and the last administration saying black people just need to want to be successful. Look at the ones that are successful. So, you know, they've made it, why can't everybody else? And that narrative is very intoxicating and soothing for people that want to look at the way things are and say, I don't have to do anything to change it. So, believe me, I grew up in the middle of the Civil Rights Movement. The gains in the Civil Rights Movement had a major impact on my life. And poverty in my community today is at the same rate or higher than it was in 1968. So it is important for us to understand that this struggle is a long struggle over time. When we're looking for solutions, there is no one solution that's going to fix this. It's not that I do these three things and the problem will go away. It ain't going to work like that. This is going to have to be a long-term effort where we are looking at the history of a problem before we come up with solutions. I'll end by saying this. Lots of people thought that if we could pass a law saying that police officers can't kneel on your neck, that would solve the George Floyd problem. And I understand why people would think that because that's what they saw on the video. And people saw that and thought, oh my God, this is so horrible. And believe me, it was. But it wasn't unique. People in America reacted like, oh my God, this has never happened before. That's been happening for the past hundred years on a regular basis. It's just that this time, somebody had a freaking cell phone and they videotaped it. So everybody had to look at it and have one of those naked lunch moments that, 
that uh, William Burroughs talked about, where everybody has to look at what's really on the end of everybody's fork. So before we start planning solutions to problems today, let's make sure we understand the entire history of what created that problem. And maybe we'll come up with solutions that don't have us taking two steps forward or three steps back. All right. All right. Thank you very much. And, uh...